Lieutenant Steve Scott of the University of Tennessee Police Department was on routine patrol at the Shelby County Regional Forensic Center, which is affiliated with the university, at 1060 Madison Avenue in Memphis. Lieutenant Scott was a seasoned law enforcement officer, having previously worked in the narcotics unit of the Shelby County Sheriff's Office. He had also been a member of the K-9 unit during his time there. However, his decades of experience did little to prepare him for the scene he stumbled upon just after midnight on June 2, 2002. During his routine patrol, Lieutenant Scott found a set of keys on the floor and realized that something was amiss. He heard a banging noise, and upon following it, he discovered a man padlocked to a window security grate in an outdoor stairwell. The man's arms were outstretched and tied to the grate. There was barbed wire around his head, hands, and feet. There was a crude, homemade explosive device around his neck. The man was Dr. O'Brien Cleary, almost exclusively known as O.C. Smith, the chief medical examiner for Shelby County. His office, as well as the county morgue, were located within the forensic center. Lieutenant Scott highly respected the doctor, and the two men had become friends, in part due to their shared interest in firearms. Dr. Smith would later admit that he did not respond to the arrival of his friend on the scene as he should have. Instead of telling Lieutenant Scott to get away from him because of the bomb, he begged him for help. I really did some things I shouldn't have done, Dr. Smith would tell reporter Janice Broach in 2006. I called for him to help me. I wasn't man enough to shut up, and I begged him to come down. Despite his extensive training, Lieutenant Scott complied. In Dr. Smith's words, he violated every protocol he knew to come down and talk to me. The Memphis Police Department bomb squad arrived on the scene, and its commander, Major Mike Willis, along with two other members of his team, successfully removed the bomb from Dr. Smith without it going off. Lieutenant Scott stayed with Dr. Smith until the device was disabled and he was freed from the grate. The barbed wire from Dr. Smith's wrists and legs was removed at the scene, but Dr. Smith wanted the wire around his head removed at the hospital, so those strands remained on his head as he was transported to the regional medical center. He was released after just four hours, having only sustained minor injuries. According to Dr. Smith, he had been attacked around 10 p.m. on June 1st as he was leaving his office. He saw a man whom he described as being Caucasian with a fleshy face, approximately six feet tall and weighing roughly 200 pounds, out of the corner of his eye. He then felt two splashes of liquid, which would later be determined to be lye, hitting his face and burning him. The attacker then punched Dr. Smith in the stomach. The assailant led Dr. Smith down to the flight of stairs. Dr. Smith stumbled and fell, and was dragged down the remaining steps, face down. The assailant then sat on the small of Dr. Smith's back, and leaned forward to wrap Dr. Smith's legs with strands of barbed wire. He then hit Dr. Smith in the head, and used other strands of barbed wire on Dr. Smith's wrists and head, before lifting him up and padlocking him to the security gate. The attacker then affixed the bomb around Dr. Smith's neck, with a canister under his chin and pulled out a tab that Dr. Smith assumed armed the bomb. The attacker did not speak until he was about to leave, when he whispered in Dr. Smith's ear, Push it, pull it, twist it, and you die. Welcome to death row. Dr. Smith took this as a warning that the device that was now on his chest was motion sensitive. The reference to death row was initially viewed as a clue to the potential motive for the attack. Almost as soon as Dr. Smith was named chief medical examiner in January of 2000, he had been heavily involved in the case of death row inmate Philip Workman. Workman's case will have its own video next week because it is too involved to quickly summarize here. For the purpose of this video, however, it is important to understand that this case was highly controversial and highly publicized. Dr. Smith had performed the autopsy of the victim in the case, Memphis Police Lieutenant Ronald Oliver, in 1981. By the time Dr. Smith became chief medical examiner, there were serious concerns over whether or not Philip Workman had actually fired the shot that killed Lieutenant Oliver. Workman's trial and appeals lawyers had requested any images from the autopsy on three different occasions, but were never provided with any. Workman's lawyers happened to notice a reference Dr. Smith made to x-rays taken during the autopsy in a letter he had written in reference to a clemency hearing for Workman set for March 8, 2000. They requested and were finally given access to the x-rays on March 2nd, 2000. 
They began the process of fighting for a new trial for Workman, based on this new evidence. Dr. Smith claimed that he had not been aware that his office still had the x-rays until recently. In court documents and in the press, Workman's lawyers argued that the x-rays were deliberately withheld. On March 30, 2001, Workman was granted a last-minute stay of execution so that his case could be reviewed by the appellate court. Shortly thereafter, in April of 2001, three strange and threatening letters were delivered to three different individuals. District Attorney General Bill Gibbons, reporter Lawrence Bucer from the Commercial Appeal, and Robert Hutton, one of Workman's attorneys. Hutton had received his letter three days after appearing on a Memphis radio show, during which he discussed his concerns about Dr. Smith. All the letters contained strange religious language, accusing Dr. Smith of being dishonest and trying to murder Workman. Smith must be returned to hell, for no purgatory can cleanse a soulless demon inhabiting a body made by the evil one, according to one of the letters. According to the letter writer, the evil one is in the body of O.C. Smith, soulless pawn of the devil, guilty of two mortal sins, the two sins being deceit and attempted murder. The letters refer to Workman, who had become religious while in prison, as an innocent child of the Holy Family that Dr. Smith was trying to murder. The letter writer was never identified. Dr. Smith was called to testify in the subsequent appellate proceeding in 2001. In his testimony, he rejected the testimony given by other expert witnesses and declared that Philip Workman's gun, and only Philip Workman's gun, could have been used in the crime. Prior to Dr. Smith's testimony, the defense seemed to have presented a strong case based on the work of other experts that Lieutenant Oliver had not been shot with Workman's gun. The judge in the proceedings ruled against Workman on January 7, 2002. While he cited a number of factors in his decision, Dr. Smith's testimony was one of them. Workman's attorneys again criticized Dr. Smith in the press throughout the following months. On March 13, 2002, a janitor discovered a bomb and two smaller explosive devices on a metal tray on the staircase outside the Regional Forensic Center. Dr. Smith was asked to come out and confirm that they were, in fact, explosives. He did. According to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, who conducted the analysis on the devices, the largest device could have killed several people. The ATF also claimed to have evidence linking the bombs to the letter writer. Analysis of the tray the devices had been placed on would later find several religious phrases in cutout letters. The phrases, now you know, scourging the flesh, crown of thorns, nail of the cross, fires of hell, forever steel, were found in between the layers of aluminum of the tray. The bomb found in March also bore similarities to the one used in the June attack. Dr. Smith's attack was also tied to the letters, because the bomb had the phrase, steel in the hands of the King of Kings, which had been used to end all of the letters, scratched into one side of it. The other side had the letters JMJ, which may stand for Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, etched into it. The potentially religious overtones of the attack itself, the barbed wire, which made Dr. Smith appear to have a crown of thorns upon his discovery, and his arms being outstretched in a manner that seemed to mimic the crucifixion, also made it appear that Doctor's attack in June was connected to the letters and the previous explosive devices. Philip Workman was interviewed in prison, and authorities investigated his family members, but no connection to the attack on Dr. Smith could be made. On June 3rd, the U.S. attorney in Memphis, Terry Harris, announced to an assembled group of representatives from every law enforcement agency in the greater Memphis area that finding whoever was responsible for the attack on Dr. Smith would be their number one priority. Dr. Smith and his wife were placed under 24-hour protection. 17 different agencies at the local, state, and federal levels would be involved in the investigation, and they would follow up on 112 leads over the next two years. Despite this massive effort, Dr. Smith's assailant was not identified. The tone of the investigation began to change by the fall of 2003. On September 15th, just nine days before the day set for Philip Workman's execution, Tennessee Governor Phil Bredesen granted him a four-month reprieve. His reasoning for granting the reprieve was a 15-month federal investigation in West Tennessee. On September 24th, Shelby County Mayor A.C. Wharton announced that he planned to remove Dr. Smith from office. 
Norton argued that he had a responsibility to say to the county commission that circumstances have developed that there is a great likelihood that Dr. Smith cannot effectively perform his duties. Being attacked and having the person responsible remaining out on the loose would be a trying experience for anyone, and certainly could have affected Dr. Smith's ability to perform his job. However, this is not what was concerning Mayor Wharton. By this time, investigators on the case were coming to the conclusion that there had never been any attack, and that Dr. Smith had staged the entire incident. On September 11, 2003, Dr. Smith had been brought in for a meeting with Special Prosecutor Patrick Harris, not to be confused with U.S. Attorney Terry Harris, and two investigators. The meeting was covertly recorded. The meeting began as Dr. Smith had probably expected it to, with him being asked to give his account of the attack. By the end of the meeting, however, Dr. Smith was being advised to confess to faking the entire incident to avoid the media circus that his trial for doing so would inevitably cause. He was offered a plea deal, but refused it. Terry Harris would eventually testify that the transition from viewing Dr. Smith as the victim of a crime to the perpetrator of one was very slow. It was routine to eliminate individuals close to a crime as suspects, so Dr. Smith had to be looked at critically as a matter of procedure. He was not cleared right away, and questions about his story lingered rather than resolved. There were several factors that led investigators to the conclusion that Dr. Smith was responsible for the incident by the end of the summer of 2003. Some of these indications were present from the very beginning of the investigation, like the lack of cuts in Dr. Smith's clothing and his minor injuries compared to what he claimed to have endured. Other indicators came over time, like the inconsistencies that came up in Dr. Smith's stories about what had happened that night in June. A federal grand jury was convened to examine the evidence against Dr. Smith. After hearing testimony for several months, the grand jury indicted Dr. Smith on two counts of making false statements to investigators and one count of unlawful possession of a bomb. If convicted on all charges, he was facing up to 20 years in prison. The indictment came down on February 10, 2004. Dr. Smith pled not guilty to the charges and was released on his own recognizance. Dr. Smith, knowing that the indictment would speed up the mayor's plans to replace him, then formally resigned from the medical examiner's office, as well as from his position as professor of pathology at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center. Dr. Smith's trial began in February 2005. Terry Harris, the U.S. attorney based out of Memphis, recused himself and the Western District of Tennessee office from the case. Harris had worked as a prosecutor for Shelby County for 14 years, meaning he had worked closely with Dr. Smith. Harris considered Dr. Smith a personal friend, and so prosecuting his case was a conflict of interest. Dr. Smith's case was therefore prosecuted by U.S. attorney Bud Cummins, and Prosecutor Patrick Harris out of the United States District Court for the Eastern District of Arkansas. Dr. Smith's defense attorney, Gerald Easter, tried to spin the trial as the ATF and the boys from Little Rock appear persecuting O.C. Smith. While this statement obviously oversimplifies the situation, it does highlight an important aspect of Dr. Smith's trial. While federal attorneys from out of state accusing a local doctor of a serious crime might not have upset a jury, like Easter intended, the situation did make some members of local law enforcement uneasy. Dr. Smith had been with the Shelby County Medical Examiner's Office since 1978. He was well-known and well-liked by local law enforcement. He had a reputation amongst police officers for being willing to go to any crime scene at any time to move an investigation forward. Local prosecutors enjoyed having him testify in court because of his enthusiasm and ability to clearly explain complex concepts. He was an everyman with a working-class upbringing, but also a brilliant and successful doctor, which earned him a lot of friends and respect throughout the Memphis criminal justice community. He appeared to still have this respect even after his indictment. District Attorney General for Shelby County Bill Gibbons still called Dr. Smith as a witness in a criminal trial the same week he was indicted. Members of various local law enforcement agencies had to be called as witnesses during Dr. Smith's trial, and some were able to show their support of Smith in their testimony. Memphis Police Lieutenant Richard Borgers, for example, had been the first on the scene on June 2nd. He was able to testify that he did not believe Dr. Smith staged the attack because of the look of terror he had seen on Dr. Smith's face 
when he arrived on the scene. Dr. Smith's place in the criminal justice community did potentially jeopardize the investigation into the events of June 1st and 2nd, 2002, right from the beginning, as it did afford him considerations that would not have been available to the average victim of a crime. Dr. Smith was allowed to return to the crime scene the day after the attack and spend most of the day in his office. ATF agent Mike Rowland would testify at trial that he had been upset that Dr. Smith was allowed back at the scene when the attacker could have still been in the area. A bomb-sniffing dog reportedly hit on Dr. Smith's vehicle during the initial sweep of the area, but the vehicle was never processed by the crime lab because, according to Memphis police detective Connie Manis, Dr. Smith was upset by the idea. At trial, the prosecution had little physical evidence indicating that Dr. Smith had staged his attack. Agents from the ATF had found holes cut in barbed wire fences on Dr. Smith's farm, but samples from those fences did not match the barbed wire used during the attack. The prosecution tried to argue that a bottle found next to Dr. Smith had contained the lye, scientifically known as sodium hydroxide, that had been thrown at his face and that the testing of the residue in that bottle showed that it had contained a heavily diluted solution of just 12% sodium hydroxide, which would burn skin, but not as harshly and instantly as solutions of between 25 and 50% would have. The defense argued that the amount of residue left in the bottle was too small for this testing to be accurate. The lack of physical evidence played a larger part in the prosecution's argument. They held that if Dr. Smith had been attacked as he had described to them, his injuries would have been much more severe. Dr. Smith's eyes were red from irritation at the hospital, but no sodium hydroxide had gotten into them, and no traces of it were found on the scrubs he had been wearing. If the solution had been thrown in his face by an assailant, it would not have been so precise and injury-sparing, according to the prosecution. Dr. Smith was also not seriously injured from any of the barbed wire that had been wrapped around him. He had a few scratches on his hands, but the injuries on his face were superficial. The trauma nurse who treated Dr. Smith at the hospital, Stephanie Ziegler, testified that while Dr. Smith's face was irritated, she did not see any punctures or lacerations on it, only noting breaks in the skin on his hands and wrists. Other witnesses would describe Dr. Smith as looking as though his face were sunburned, or as though he had been in a fistfight the day after the alleged attack. Dr. Smith would later argue that his face did not have severe lacerations because the barbed wire was old and dull. While Dr. Smith's injuries may seem minor for the dramatic attack, trying to quantify how injured someone should be is problematic, especially when it is done by lawyers, not medical professionals. Another major issue the prosecution raised during the trial was how Dr. Smith's assailant was able to overpower him. Dr. Smith normally carried a gun and kept a knife in his boot, but had neither of them with him on the night he says he was attacked. While Dr. Smith was 49 in June 2002, he had been a medical officer in the Navy Reserves for the previous 25 years, and had excellent physical fitness and self-defense reports. Bud Cummins raised the issue of why such a skilled individual would fail to put up a fight when being attacked. William Lee Hickey, who was the recipient of three Purple Hearts and the Navy Cross, testified that Dr. Smith was one of the finest doctors he had ever worked with while in the service. When asked on the stand why he thought Dr. Smith took such a passive approach when he was attacked, Hickey argued that part of dealing with a surprise attack involves staying calm and assessing the situation. Since Dr. Smith claimed he could not see after the lie hit his face, he would not have been able to see if his attacker was armed or not, so the passive approach may have been appropriate. The prosecution mainly took issue with the fact that Dr. Smith did not fight back after he was lying on the ground. According to Dr. Smith's early accounts of his attack, his assailant had sat on the small of his back and tied his feet with the barbed wire first. In this scenario, Dr. Smith's hands would have been free, giving him the ability to fight back. If he had pushed himself up, his assailant would have fallen to the ground, and he would have had the upper hand in either fighting him off or running away. This moment in Dr. Smith's account caused other problems for him as well. It is one of the main inconsistencies that helped turn suspicion towards him in the first place. In his initial statements to authorities, Dr. Smith provided detailed accounts of his attacker tying his feet before tying his wrists. In the September 2003 interview, he said that his wrists had been tied first. 
Dr. Smith had also initially given a detailed description of the assailant, but later said that he did not get a good look at him. All of these details show that Dr. Smith may have staged the attack, but they do not explain why he would have done so. To explain their proposed motive, prosecutors hired famed forensic psychiatrist Dr. Park Dietz. Dr. Smith's lawyers would not allow him to be examined by Dr. Dietz. As such, Dr. Dietz had to limit his testimony to simply explaining the different types of disorders that would lead an individual to stage an attack on themselves. He talked at length about factitious disorder, in which an individual makes themselves appear ill in order to get attention. Prosecutors believed that Dr. Smith's alleged attack was an example of factitious victimization, and that he had made it appear as though he had been attacked to garner sympathy from the public. The prosecution alleged that Dr. Smith's decision to stage the attack on himself in June 2002 was a bid to improve public perception of him. Faced with increasing criticism over his testimony in the Philip Workman case, a case which he had allegedly been obsessed with, Dr. Smith wanted to garner public sympathy. Being attacked by someone who opposed Workman being executed would have had the added benefit of making those who opposed Dr. Smith and his opinion of the case look unbalanced. While this theory sounds insane, it would technically be possible. ATF agent Michael Rowland testified that he had gone to the crime scene and had been able to attach himself to the security grate in the position Dr. Smith had been discovered in twice, so staging the attack would have been physically possible. The prosecution also presented details about Dr. Smith's personality and relationships that supported their theory. Dr. Smith had a reputation for not taking kindly to criticism or being questioned, and when he was named chief medical examiner, he had made a number of administrative changes that were not popular with the rest of the office. As the public criticism of Dr. Smith increased in regards to the Philip Workman case, the morale in the office decreased. Dr. Smith's lawyers even tried to argue that the theory that Dr. Smith staged the attack had originated in the medical examiner's office suggested by disgruntled employees who resented Dr. Smith's new procedures. Autopsy technician Rhonda Job did testify that she and others in the office had been upset by some of the changes Dr. Smith had made, and admitted that she and some of her co-workers had discussed the possibility that Dr. Smith's attack was a hoax. However, she also said that Dr. Smith was brilliant, and burst into tears on the stand as she described how she loved and missed working with him. Dr. Stephen Symes, who had a very public falling out with Dr. Smith when he left the Regional Forensic Center, testified at the trial that while he had concerns about how the center was run under Dr. Smith, he still considered Dr. Smith to be the greatest he had ever worked with. While Dr. Smith's actions may not have always been appreciated, he was respected in his office. While Dr. Smith did have a long career in the Navy Reserves as a medical officer, he had a habit of misleading people about what exactly he did with the Navy. He claimed to have written the Marine Close Kill Manual, taught sniper tactics, and been sent on secret military intelligence operations. Commander Rick Russell, a Navy personnel records expert, was called to testify about Dr. Smith's service. Dr. Smith's records did not indicate that he had been involved in any intelligence missions. Dr. Smith's defense team tried to argue that the secret missions would not have been in his standard file but according to Commander Russell, his location during such missions would have been noted in his file, and his total daily credits for active duty would have been higher if he had been on such missions. Commander Russell also testified that Dr. Smith had not received the required military training in the specialties he claimed to have. Lieutenant Colonel Paul Schultz of the FBI Training Academy in Quantico also testified that there was no record of Dr. Smith ever having attended sniper training there as he claimed. The defense continued to assert that not only had Dr. Smith been trained there, he had taught there as well. Other witnesses provided testimony about other grand claims Dr. Smith had made about himself. Michael Means, a sheriff's deputy from Texas, testified that Dr. Smith had asked him about acquiring a large shipment of guns for a contact he had in the Middle East while at a forensics conference in 2002. When he began making progress on fulfilling the request, Dr. Smith suddenly claimed that he was no longer hearing from his unnamed contact. Other acquaintances of Dr. Smith report that he had claimed to have been a mercenary in Central America, and that his family had all been killed in Africa. These accounts were not accurate. 
The case was sent to the jury on February 25th. The jury deliberated for three full days, but remained deadlocked. On March 1st, 2005, U.S. District Judge Bernice Donald accepted the jury's assertion that they were unable to reach a verdict, and declared a mistrial. On March 14th, prosecutors announced that they would not be retrying Dr. Smith. No other suspect in the attack on Dr. Smith has ever been identified. Only three members of the jury had wanted to find Dr. Smith guilty. At least three of the nine jurors who voted to acquit Dr. Smith did so because they thought he had really been attacked. Other jurors did not buy into the idea of factitious victimization, and some did not believe that the prosecution had provided solid evidence that Dr. Smith faked his attack. I personally agree that there was not enough evidence presented at trial to prove Dr. Smith guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. When it comes to my own opinion about whether or not Dr. Smith staged his attack, I am conflicted. I can see how Dr. Smith, tired of being publicly criticized and known to fabricate stories to make himself look important, might create scenarios in which he is the victim. I think it is believable that he sent the threatening letters and left the explosive devices outside of his office. As larger than life as some of his fabricated military achievements are, I even think that it is conceivable that Dr. Smith burned himself with lie, strapped himself to a security grate, and claimed to be attacked. I stop thinking that Dr. Smith could have faked the attack as soon as the live bomb attached to his chest comes into play. I cannot imagine putting a live explosive device around my own neck for any reason. I suppose Dr. Smith could have done so if he really were mentally ill. He also was familiar with what the Memphis Police Bomb Squad would be able to safely disarm, and could have built the device to comply with their knowledge to maximize his chances of surviving unharmed. That being said, the bomb still keeps me from fully accepting the idea that the attack was a hoax. If Dr. Smith was attacked as he claimed, I am puzzled by the lack of any further escalation from his attacker. If the assailant was as unstable as he appeared in his letters, and he did escalate from the letters to the devices outside the forensic center to the attack on Dr. Smith, I find it hard to believe that he simply stopped his dangerous behavior cold turkey unless he passed away shortly after assaulting Dr. Smith. Even though no one was seriously injured in this incident, the lack of resolution to it is still troubling. If Dr. Smith was attacked, a dangerous criminal has remained free. While we don't know of any similar crimes this individual has committed since 2002, that does not mean that he did not change his patterns and continue to harm others. If Dr. Smith did fake the attack, it is even more troubling. Dr. Smith performed thousands of autopsies and testified at hundreds of criminal trials, some of which were capital cases. I am concerned by the idea that someone who was deeply disturbed enough to place the lives of four law enforcement officers and himself in danger just to get people to stop criticizing his work played a part in so many serious matters. Dr. Smith attempted to get his job in the medical examiner's office back after his trial, but was unsuccessful possibly due to these concerns, which have never been definitively assuaged. Dr. Smith's life was not the only one derailed by his trial. His friend, Lieutenant Steve Scott, the police officer who discovered him on June 2, 2002, also feared legal repercussions once the investigation turned towards Dr. Smith. Lieutenant Scott was interrogated by the ATF so many times that he began to fear that he was going to be charged as Dr. Smith's accomplice. No charges were ever filed against him, but prosecutors did tell reporter Janice Broach that they did believe that Lieutenant Scott was withholding information from them. By 2005, Lieutenant Scott was suffering from liver cancer. His wife, Virginia Scott, alleges that his health took a rapid decline during Dr. Smith's trial due to the stress it put him under. Lieutenant Scott testified at the trial, bringing Dr. Smith to tears in the courtroom with his account of finding him that night. The Scots remained close with Dr. Smith. Virginia asked him to be with her at a meeting with Steve's doctors discussing his prognosis. At that meeting, doctors told her that all they had left to do for Steve was put him in hospice care. Lieutenant Steve Scott passed away just a few months after Dr. Smith's trial ended. Virginia Scott believes she would have had more time with her husband had federal agents not investigated him so thoroughly. I feel like Steve would be alive had the ATF not harassed him so much trying to make a case, she told Janice Broach in 2006. 
Dr. Smith went into private practice after he was not allowed back in at the medical examiner's office, testifying as an expert witness on behalf of defendants at their trials. In 2006, he announced that he had plans to write a book about his attack in the ensuing trial that would provide additional information about the case. He was looking for a publisher at the time. He does not appear to have ever found one, as the book was never published. Dr. Smith passed away on July 9th, 2019, at the age of 66.